Okay, okay. In Women Matters today, we talk about why do women so much worry about their weight? Why do they do one diet after the other, one way after the other, and always feel too fat, except the very tiny ones, they want to gain weight, no? The um, people who have uh, in youth some disturbances, I got to know some of them and they would like to have some more, but anyway. We, as we are here, as I saw when we were talking just now, we are more on the other side. How can I lose weight? You know, Beatrice, but before we are talking about this, as always, uh, check in. And I give it over to you at, uh, immediately, Beatrice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to check in on that topic, but... Um... Let's see. Boy, it's been a while. I've been all over the place. I'm currently in Ohio. Oh. Um, <laughs> every time I log in, I'm somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, I was in New York for six weeks. Um, it was supposed to be a three week trip. And uh, for one project that, that became two projects. And then while I was there, I uh, found out about a, an audition that was looking for dancers and performers. Um, and so I just decided, you know what, let me, let me try, try, you know, I'd never actually auditioned in person for anything in New York before. Mm. And I did, and I got a part. And in the process of the audition, the director overheard me say that I do production work and, you know, administrative work too. And so she offered me two positions. She offered me a performing role and a production stage manager role um, that were not, you know, I could say yes to either or both. Um, so I got to be a performer and a production stage manager, which was crazy <laughs> because it was, you know, had two hour rehearsal block. And then on the two hours before and two hours after, you know, it was setting up the stage and doing the spreadsheets and organizing everything. Um, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, and it felt like a very, I don't know, a year ago, I decided I wanted to be a professional dancer again. And, um, or not again, I guess. I, I mean, I don't know. I've been performing I, in some ways, I guess you could say I'm a professional dancer already, but I wanted to take dance more seriously and, you know, maybe perform on the stage again and maybe perform in someone else's work again. And, um, and then, you know, it's been a year of, I've started taking classes again, but, you know, I lost jobs. I've moved across the country, I like, traveled, <laughs> lots been going on. And somehow, even despite all of that, I got a part, a professional part in a performance in New York City. So that felt very exciting. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest update. Then I went back to Portland for a week and a half. Um, and now I'm in Ohio visiting someone and then I'm going to go to Philadelphia in a couple of days for a blues dance event. And then I'm going back to New York, um, possibly for another, another iteration of a project I'm working on. Um, but mostly because I'm just nearby and I'm going to clear out my stuff from my Brooklyn apartment and actually say goodbye to that chapter. Not to New York, but at least to like living in that apartment and potentially going back to that life and all of that. Um, and then go back to Portland. So sorry, that was a long ramble, but <laughs> there's been a lot going on. Um, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, exactly. That's my life right now. And I don't know, it feels like I might be doing this for a while before I, you know, maybe land somewhere. Um, I'll pass to my mother. Can I ask a question, Beatrice? Yeah. Do you feel like the arts are as open again and back online at, as before the pandemic, or do you still feel like it's slow to roll out? I feel like it's fast. Oh, okay. I feel like every, every project that was put on hold, everything that everybody wanted, anybody wanted to do, now everybody's trying to do everything. I think there's okay. a lot more opportunity right now, and I think it'll settle back into where it was at some point but right now it feels like there's a thousand things going on everywhere I mean at least in New York I don't know I don't know about the rest of the world 
or the rest of the country but in new york at least it's crazier than ever the number of things happening and yeah which is you know exciting too um but yeah okay ma you're up ma you're up um <clears throat> thank you are you long, up <laughs> long time no see no no i've already been out and about i was at, i've already been to morning mass i've already delivered three huge containers of recycling to rent a bus for the church youth to go to a conference i've done my good deed for the day um i yeah i'm a bit of a zombie these days i um have I just came out of a four day intensive um, meditation retreat held online, um, traditionally held over the last 30 years, apparently in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, but who's that? Maybe Annelie, let's wait. Let's but you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I've realized that, that um, I can't, have my cake and eat it too. I can't meditate. Oh, it is Hanali. Good. Hello, Hanali. Hello, butterfly. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so so it was it I I wanted to respect the parameters of this retreat, and I still have like a million things going on right now. Um, I'm right in the middle of my Diaglyph lecture series, which is very exciting and very fun, but exhausting. Um, I'm supposed to read a 400 page book by this evening for a discussion. Um, I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> so that's, that's an assignment for the day. Um, I have to choose anyway, it just, um, yeah, a million things. I, I think Beatrice is right. I, at least in my life, it's um, the combination of going back into the real world and, and trying to continue an online life is um is very daunting indeed but i feel like 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 this group for example i i feel strongly committed to keeping up the relationships that i have formed during the pandemic because in many ways i feel like the friends i've made like you all of you are closer and dearer to me than than the people i couldn't see for the last three years um so so that's making it like a double life. Um, I think I had kind of a double life already before that, to tell you the truth. But, but it's um, that intensifies my, at least in my case, my schedule because I'm trying to be faithful to the online schedule that I established during the pandemic, and um, get out and about in the in the you know the outside world and do all the things I did before the pandemic. So it's 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 like living the life of two people, but right now I'm, st I'm still persevering because um, like this, this morning, um, just to say hello and see your faces. It means a lot to me because, you know, you're, you're really my real people. <laughs> and someday I hope um, I can give you all hugs. And um, so, so this may be my contribution. Um, I already made my weight loss speech before everybody logged on. So uh, Monia or Heidi, you can transmit my sad story. Um, <laughs> so, um, although, well, can I say one thing? Cause I, I will have to just slip away uh, in terms of the subject matter. I think um, it, I mean, it's a huge subject of course and has a lot of angles, but um, in my case, I am definitely doing it so that I can actually like walk without pain and tap dance again, hopefully, and um, move around and feel, feel good in my body. It's not a vanity thing. Cause I gave that up. I don't think I ever had the vanity thing. Cause I never felt like I looked good enough to make any difference anyway. So, um, but I do deplore the pressure that's put on women particularly, but in general on society. Um, okay, so that's my statement because I, <laughs> I'm i gonna have to slip away, but I love you all. And um, this is my check in, check out, um, whatever. And I, I hope to see you without impediment um, next time. I mean, without another appointment, lots of love. Um, can I pass to Hanali just because she just came in? Is that okay? I know it's kind of against the rules, but. All right. 
Thank you, Victoria. It's also good to see you before you leave. Thank you. I'm glad I made it in time. Um, I'm Hannah Lee. I'm here in Johannesburg. Um, we have been having incredible midsummer uh, weather, like heat waves, with no rain yet. So it really caught us all of guard. And I'm just back from nature, a week in nature. And I had all these plans to sit right next to the river, this most beautiful tranquil setting. But I did none of that. I simply just were in a being state. And it was so interesting because it was like I had no mind. It was, I tried many times to do stuff and it didn't work. And then I just surrendered and let it go. And it was such a great reminder just to come back into state of being after a few very, very, very active years, very busy years non-stop going 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 and so when my, my return to Johannesburg I the first morning when I came back I had an incredible allergy allergic reaction um it was the worst I ever had and it kept on for a week and nothing else that would usually help for something like that and I just realized <laughs> I was sort of allergic to coming back into the city and I really miss nature <laughs> so it were, I had to work through all those feelings, obviously, but it was not easy. My nose were just running, it, my eyes swollen and, and itchy and my body. And the mosquitoes, because of this heat, is, is really, they are really angry at the moment. And as a child, I was highly allergic to them, their bites. And suddenly now as an adult for the first time, I'm experiencing that again. So it was just all this allergic reactions to the environment, so to speak, and then to just relax and let it go and allow it to take its course. But now I'm good, thank you. But I also realized why I had to, I think I just picked up on some of the words you just shared, Victoria, of integrating the online and the physical life as well. And, not, and also whatever is happening in our lives that I haven't had much time for, I didn't create much time for that and without much time in the last three, four years. So hence just being was such a big, big blessing. And to realize that we have to make time for those type of integrations. And it's something that I've been passionate about for more than a decade as well, to help people integrate different aspects of their lives, especially in the business world, where we have all these silos. So, but thank you, I'm complete, I'm here. I don't know what the topic is today, so I will not immediate make some, say something about that. I'm complete, I don't know who haven't checked in. Um, I'll check in. Um, hmm. uh, everything's basically good. Um, uh, getting ready. I'll be actually gone the next two sessions for Women's Matters. In two weeks, I will be in Washington, D.C. at a conference um, for my work. And uh, two weeks after that, we're going to be in Sedona uh, wrapping up at the um, WTF, <laughs> which stands for <laughs> What's the Future? Um, uh, integral conference in Sedona, Arizona. So looking forward to that. Sedona is really a magical, uh, magical place. Um, so always enjoy going there, but I will not, so I will not be able to attend the next two, two sessions. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know, every day I spend thinking about uh, my work life, and winding that down and, and transitioning to retirement. I've probably brought this up a million times already, but as I said, it's kind of on my mind almost every day because um, I do some form of work pretty much almost every day. Um, and I'm trying to sprinkle in more non-work activities, fun things for the most part, um, and other things I'm curious about. Uh, to kind of help with the, having a vision of where I'm headed um, because it's hard to let go of work if I don't have anything that I feel like is in front of me. So I'm trying to do stuff. Uh, Victoria, you may be interested. Uh, this past week, I went down to the Rady Shell and you can listen to the symphony, San Diego Symphony perform. 
they're, they're practicing. Whenever they practice at the Shell, it's just open to the public. So that was really fun, listening to the San Diego Symphony for uh, over two hours as they were practicing. I don't know if you knew you could, you could do that. Um, yeah, so spending time thinking about transitions, uh, what I wanna do next, trying to have some fun times with uh, girlfriends and friends. Um, I'm going to Washington DC and I'll see family uh, while I'm there. I've got a conference for three days and then I'm gonna spend some extra time. So I get to see my sister and my niece and her family. So I'm really uh, looking forward to connecting to them again. So you can think about me next uh, Monday, you know, our next session and I'll be uh, hopefully uh, tromping around the uh, nation's capital and hopefully there won't be any disturbances. <laughs> All right, I am done. Nanya, do you want to speak up? Um, yep. Huh. Well, I have been, or well, we, my husband and I, have been reducing, which is the topic of today, Anneli, uh, why do women, why are women so fixated on losing weight, or is it that, yeah, something like that? And we have been reducing almost all activities outside shopping, unnecessary groceries. Um, and the pandemic has left a couple of pounds, many couples of pounds on my hips and etc. And as Victoria said, um, it's not a matter of vanity, it's a matter of my joints and of my bones. And I, I'm going to see the uh, orthopedic uh, doctor on Wednesday because uh, it's about 10 years, 12 years that I got uh, an implant on my left hip and somehow I, I feel it. It doesn't feel right, so I have to get an X-ray, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But finally, I got myself that I'll have to do that because it doesn't go away. And every pound I lose will just make it a little lighter to step. And it's yeah. So I'm writing the topic already. So, but first, I give on pass on to Heidi. Yeah, thank you. It's so nice to see you again, Beatrice and Haneli. was such a long time that we didn't see. With Victoria, a little less long, but also quite long. So, And I invite you both in the German group on, on Tuesday again. So when you have time and, uh, how do you say, willingness to speak German, you are ever invited again. Yeah, as uh, for me, I think I told you that I have a nice little young dog, a second little doggy, and it's fine, it's running out there. Um, the heat has gone here. It's um, strange skies, I have to say, really strange skies. It has rained twice or three times, a little bit more. But the weather is, uh, in Italy, they would say uh, malato. It's uh, ill. We the didn't talk, Ill. nobody talked about the weather. You talk about the weather. I today do the weather <laughs> service. Yeah, somebody has to do that, you know. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and I have prepared my vegetable garden. The first um, cabbage plants are already this, this height. Oops, yeah, sort of. And, and new ones are still small and it's a better time for growing in Italy than in summer. And I hope uh, last, like yes, last year, I will have vegetables all over the winter until March, April, normally. Hanneli, when are you coming? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that, Heidi. We're working on okay. that. Good, 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 good. Yeah, and as for the topic, I can remember when I uh, now see photos when I was 18, 19, I was really slim, but I already then I thought I'm too fat. And I tried to, to 
have people look me from the side because I was ashamed of my butt, who seemed to be too big. So for me, it was really always a, a problem. And now when I really a bit more, uh, I wouldn't say fat, but uh, proper, let's say, <laughs> I have much less problems than I had when I was young. So it seems also to have to do uh, with our fixed ideas of how we could be desirable for men. That's my hypothesis. What, what do you think? Let's talk with the youngest one first. What is it with you? Do you think when you are, if you were bigger, that would be desirable or the less? And I know there are men who like really uh, women like this, you know, so. <laughs> Well, I can remember even before I was interested in, you know, my sexuality or being attractive to guys, I, I'm sure I looked at my first exposure was fashion magazines, I'm sure, you know, beginning as a preteen and, and all the fashion magazines and looking at that. And then it just gets this idea in your head because models are such an unrealistic um, look at, at the female body. But I think the template gets laid down, uh, or it did for me, and I think for a lot of girls early on, um, by the images that were sold over and over and over and over and over again. And um, I know as an adult, I'm just more aware of the health benefits of keeping your BMI in that range that it's supposed to be. And when it gets out of the BMI range, you know, the, the joints and cancer and all kinds of things, diabetes, all kinds of things, um, especially as you're older, uh, can end up being a problem. So I'm, I guess, watchful uh, because of that reason. Um, don't watch, not look at a fashion magazines these days. <laughs> I'm wondering in America, was there also Twiggy? We had Twiggy. She was a super thin unnatural being so it yes. is all over the world already the propaganda oh dear yeah, yeah. long time ago <laughs> well but i guess we all found out in the meantime that the fashion designers who created women like twiggy uh, they were scared of real women they wanted boys some kind of boyish figures. So that's, uh, yeah, it's really an affront to a woman to have to look like a twig, <laughs> ridiculous. But it took some time to find that out that it was just an invention of homosexual fashion designers. Oh, okay. That's my, what I finally sort of figured out. In the 30s and 20s of last century, when you see the films, the dancers were real women. And by the way, Beatrice, when I see your dance, I'm so glad that you are not a Twiggy, but that you are a real woman. <laughs> and you dance beautifully. I really have to say that. All right. Thank so you. When do you, yeah, do you, uh, at least do you want to go on? Oh, I was just going to say thank you. I think Hanalee just unmuted, so I'll let her jump in. Now, all I wanted to say with me scary is as a young, as a young girl, I was very, act I've always been very active. So or either dancing or running or playing sports or doing something like that without it just because I loved it. I loved dancing and I was, I, was been, I was dancing since I was a very little girl. So it was in my blood to move, so to speak. But if I now look at the current environment and I look at some of the younger people, especially when my daughter was at school and uh, now even still her friends, um, it's really scary that it seems that, yes, I know at my age, we were also had, you know, there was always these imprints as well from, from what we should look like, the body image and the likes, but it, it's like, it's, um, 
escalated mm. somehow. Because if I think back as us as girls, yes, we wanted to look beautiful, but it was not about, uh, it wasn't, uh, we wanted to experiment like, for example, makeup and stuff like that. But it wasn't, um, I don't think we had so many problems for anorexia and bulimia. When I was young, if I look now back at today's young people, now I'm just speaking through the lens of my own daughter and her age group and even after, that it's really scary that it's escalated so much. And the social media, it's really cruel. So it really worsens it. So it's very difficult, I think, for young girls to grow up these days in such environments because um, the online world is just, yeah, it's just incredible, the bullying and the shaming and the, and the likes because of body images. But there's also there's this beautiful young woman. I don't know how, but somehow I got connected with her on Facebook um, at the start of the pandemic, but she's a big girl, huge. And she went on a journey where she, because also of health reasons, obviously, to, to uh, reduce her weight, but to become more healthy. And now she's really thin. So there's this contrast, but her journey is so incredibly inspiring because of the message that she shares with other young women is not that you, you're fat. It's, it's really about your body must be in balance and what she did to get where she is today. Now, I know myself, if you have arthritis, for example, Every kilogram that you that you reduce uh, is creating fifteen percent less pressure on your joints, and that's quite a bit. So I was thinking about that, Monia, when you were sharing. So it's not about losing weight; it's about having that your body's in balance. And when you realize that on a cellular level something shifts, that all the mental stuff doesn't matter because you you know it's about you and your body, and you don't want to be in pain, you don't want to um, experience shame, for example, from, in, from the inside out, then things begin to shift, but it's not an easy journey to get there. But I remember that um, my, I suddenly, in my early 50s, I, my mom had very bad arthritis. And suddenly my fingers, because I'm a writer and I was writing all the time, I suddenly had only my fingers, but no pain. So it was just swollen. And that's when I discovered this incredible book that a friend of mine in Turkey gave me um, that a doctor wrote about this whole idea that how you heal from the inside out in that sense and then the effect it will have on your physical weight as well. Now, it's that, it was such an incredible book at the time that I read it because I never had pain. So it was just the sight of my hands being a little bit, you know, they're not straight. But I've never had pain. So I always found it very interesting. Out, I don't have pain because my mom was in severe pain, um, in, especially in her older days. But then I realized how you, look, how you experience it from the inside out, how you can reduce that pain. And then obviously, if you reduce the weight, the impact that they have of the pressure on your joints. So I think we begin to learn, what I want to say is we begin to learn so much more about our bodies and our body-mind our connection that we can shift those unhealthy body images that was induced on us through, through conditioning slowly and eventually get free of it. I don't know if that makes sense. What was the name of that book? Got it about my daughter. I'll send you the link. I, I just need to get you the, she's, it's at my daughter's house, but it's an incredible book because um, it introduced me to the joy meditation. It's something really simple. You, when they make, in the morning when you wake up, you can use something else as well. Another word, another concept, but I, I chose joys, a joy. So when you woke up in the morning, you, when you wake, you, um, in your mind, you say the word. So say if you say peace or love, what, it could be any, doesn't matter what the word is, but it must have a good meaning to you. And then, in, then you say it out loud, loud after that. So in your mind, you say joy. And then you say the word out loud, joy. And you keep on doing that for 20 minutes before you get up in the morning. I can just tell you, it puts, it's part of this program. It puts you in such a state that that's why I said I've never had pain in that sense. 
And in the, the whole idea of my body image changed, of the, my own idea of my body image changed as well after that, through that process, which had nothing to do with why I was reading the book. Because when I was in Turkey in 2012, this friend of mine saw my hands and she thought I must be in pain. And then she, and she, got, me, then she got me the book. It was not a Turkish author, it's an English book. And she said, you must read this. And I, and I was really grateful for it because I did. And even the way you were speaking about, and I think it did contribute to my early experience this year with burning too, of how you take a holistic view of everything. That you put yourself in a state of being before you look at, and then you go to the cause of something, not treating symptoms. So even the body image dilemma that has been induced on us, uh, it helps too. But I'll get you the, I'll go to my daughter on the weekend and I'll send you the, the um, title. Thank you, Beatrice. I think, I think that's really important. Um, the holistic view and also being aware of what your, your own body is asking for and not, you know, I, medicine and science, I mean, there's, there's a lot out there that does give us good information, but it's generalized over the whole population. You know, how do they, how do they decide what the BMI, I mean, I think the BMI thing actually has been debunked recently. Um, I don't remember exactly, but, you know, how do they decide these things about what is healthy or what isn't healthy? Just not looking at body image or, you know, propaganda, but from the scientific or medical side. And it's, you know, all that information comes from studying a small group of people and then having a generalized conclusion. And it's not really addressing each individual body. And I think sometimes we get too caught up in trying to be this exact you know, medium version, which nobody can actually obtain. And, and, you know, I think it's better to look at those as guidelines, but it's, but if you learn what your own body needs or is asking for, or where you feel like you're healthy and you're in a good place, I think that's, that's what we should be seeking. And I also, it annoys me, like in the medical field, that there's so many specialized doctors and you know, I don't know. I sometimes, I, <laughs> I don't know anything about what it was like when there was like one family practitioner that, you know, knew you since you were born and would do home visits. And, you know, I'm thinking of like watching movies and stuff, but, but I've always kind of wished that that was more of a thing nowadays where someone really knows you and knows all of the elements of your life and then can say, okay, I think you're struggling with this thing because it's related to this other thing that you're going through rather than just at diagnosing symptoms blind, you know, not knowing the person and just saying, oh, I've decided that this is what's wrong with you. Um, I don't know. I don't really know what soapbox I'm getting on here, but I think whole beingness is so important and getting in touch with that. I would like to, to add here this idea that somebody says sugar is bad or fat is bad and the next one says fat is good sugar is good coffee is good no coffee is bad wine is good no wine is bad so at the end you don't know what it is vegan is good no vegan is not good and you know you can find whatever you want for, for and against something so the normal person like me for instance uh, i don't know what is good i think Vegetable is probably good, but mm. but this is one thing, the confusion which we are left because we cannot trust any, let's say, recommendations because also the doctors, the dietologists, they they learn a certain a certain direction, and another one has learned another school. And so mm, what has it to do with you? And then came to my mind, there are people who are medical intuitives. Or maybe it, when we came, when I went to South Africa, we went to the shamans. Uh, and she, one of them, she told me that there is something with my belly, but then I didn't, I don't know what it is because here the normal doctors don't find anything. So that's, who knows? But uh, maybe it's the case that we find these people who are intuitive and know what, 
what is the best thing for you when we are not able. I'm not really able to understand what would be the best thing. Yeah, I understand when I eat certain things, that's not good, you know, but what would be the best thing? I don't know. Or the be better things, let's say. Not really. Have you ever had experience with a medical intuitive? Hmm. Did you like to share that? Yeah, I just I was just wanting to look up his name. Um, he was an incredible man. I don't think he's alive still. He's actually from San he's South African, but he was living in the US most of his adult life. He had so many letters behind his name, you could you could drag them. He had so many degrees and stuff. He was world famous, but what he was world famous for was he was one of the first medical doctors who introduced medical hypnosis to the world. And that was in the 70s. And it was very interesting. He met, I met him for LinkedIn. He was right, he, he was he wrote several books and he was teaching you to do medical hypnosis on yourself. So to be intuitive on your own body. So he would take you into your own body, into the cells, in, because he understood that part because of his uh, medical background. But when you when you heard his story, it was just incredible. And he was one of my biggest cheerleaders. I actually thought about him last week. He was an old man when I met him, older man, and he was sending me a copy of his, a part of his book online on LinkedIn, but I never read it. And then we became pen pals at the time. Now this is around 2013, 14, and became lovely, lovely friends. And he, he was really inspiration to me. And then he told me his story. Now in the 70s, he had, um, he almost died from prostate cancer because if they did, if they had to do an operation, they had to cut through such a big um, vein that he would have bleed, bleed to death at the time. And there was no at that time there was nothing to help for that. So operation wasn't the answer, uh, the, you know, to his dilemma at the time. And somehow he discovered this woman in I think she was also in San Diego. He discovered this woman who was doing hypnosis. And obviously, it was totally against the medical fraternity at the time. And it was not even psychology, you know, from a psychiatrist's point of view, it wasn't frowned upon at the time. And he, you hear his story, it was just beautiful. How while he was with her, he just intuitively got to her. And he discovered, but why can't he use the same methods that she was? He doing on him from a hypnosis point of view, from a medical hypnosis point of view. So he started experimenting on himself at the time because he couldn't have this operation. And I still get the shivers if I think about if you really hear the whole story, I'll just share little bits of it, of how he was pushed out of the medical fraternity. For 10 years, he didn't make any money as a normal doctor. And he was world famous in his speciality at the time. He was speaking at conferences and he was writing many, many books about his specialities. And he was pushed out of the medical fraternity for so such a long time and they really had no money, and, but he just kept through. And more and more people started to trust him. Some of his old patients came back and he slowly started building up this practice and to create gravity that he was accepted again in, in, the, in, the, in the American society. And um, then after that, he was teaching this worldwide. This, but he, teach, he had videos on his website where you could do it, teach you how to do it yourself. And it was just so incredible to, to, to converse with this man and to see his struggle of, but also continuing. And he was just too early for society at the time to really uh, embrace it. So that was one success story. I myself have um, made many such intuitives in my lifetime, not for healing me, but I just worked with some of them, especially in Turkey as well, um, where um, it's just incredible. You are simply a channel for the divine. You are not doing anything yourself in that sense. It's your connection to life. And there are many other stories about that that I can tell, but I was just thinking about 
this doctor and his story about medical hypnosis at the time and how it saved many, many lives. And he himself, he himself got healed through medical hypnosis, diet, and exercise. So what he was eating, so nutrition rather than diet. Nutrition, exercise, even at his worst states, he said he was trying to run 10 kilometers every morning. And his body struggled, but he knew intuitively he must keep on doing it. So he said in the beginning, he couldn't even walk to the, you know, to the corner of the street. But he continued with that because somehow he intuitively knew that combination between medical hypnosis, where he would literally go into the cells and heal them from, from there by himself. So self-healing through the hypnosis and then also nutrition. So he was a big, he was a big source of lots of wisdom, I think, relating to preventative health at that time as well, in the 80s, and still in the 90s, still I met him in the 2000s. Um, yeah, so I did to say yes, I have. And it was, I can just tell you when you were sitting, you know, I was just writing to me because we never engaged like this. And even for his writing, she, it was like you were there next to him. It was incredible, the power he had, and he was so humble um, of sharing this with the world. Thank you. So why doesn't it really take a bigger place in our societies, this sort of healing and self-healing and taking care for oneself? Well, I personally, just about my own personal experience, I think it's because We've come from a time where the age of reason, which is about, we look at the mind, it's, it's uh, the mind classifies things to be able to, for us to identify things. So it's silos. So our, if we look at even our education, everything is still like that. A lot of it is still like that. You have science, you have math, uh, um, psychology, you have whatever, but it's all silos. But when you look at it from, a, from an integrated perspective, it's all connected. But we, never, we come from that time where it was all silo. So it's, I do feel we are in, in a transition stage where we become to realize, like you said, Beatrice, a whole body experience, whole person experience. And then integrative medicine, for example, a, realist, a more realistic view of all these things together. And I know of many friends who have passed because the doctors didn't know what the other one was doing. Somebody had a, a disease, and then the other one, they were treated, well, this one treated them for something, and the other one treated them for something, and then the medication worked against each other. But that, that it was, they never had a, a whole picture of everything together. So I, but I think we are moving towards that. And I also think the self-healing thing is just simply fear, fear of our own power, because we've been conditioned to fear our own power. We've always thought somebody else must heal us. We must go to the doctor. So if you go and look at the indigenous societies, they're not like that at all. You go and look at the shamanic societies in South America, neither. You're taught to heal yourself. But in our Western society, especially in Western medicine, um, from I cannot even remember that I was ever taught as a little girl that you can actually heal yourself because you go to the doctor even if you have a little sore on your finger you go to the doctor to heal it so it was an authority figure sense of some thought sorts but i do feel that we are there is a transition going up because we've got so much more access to more information and we have so many more op op options after the internet came than we had before because we now suddenly know about things that we didn't have any access to before so I think with the, with the, because the world's opening up, that will be happening. And people will not be so afraid of the fact that we actually have the power to heal ourselves. It doesn't say that we don't need help of others, but it, it still, it comes from our self-responsibility of taking care of ourselves. Thank you, Hanali. The thing with the internet, as we said before, it can be very good because you can learn a lot. Or like you said, with the um, uh, social media, 
pushing girls into anorexia, bulimia, and that's certainly not the best way to treat oneself. No? So. Well, it also has to do with how you're being taught. I mean, I think the thing you said, Hanalee, about indigenous cultures, it's, you know, the children don't just wake up isolated knowing these things. They're taught from generations and by community. And, and so that then when they are adults, they have this internalized knowledge, you know, to do that. So I think it ha it's also how it's passed down. You know, you look at your parents and your grandparents or your family and how do they solve problems or who do they trust or all of that. And then you're told how you're supposed to function. So I think it's very hard in this society to find that integrated knowledge because we're not being taught how to access it or where it is. I still have a curiosity about the losing weight thing. You say every kilo is about 15, I, I, I forgot what it was, but that it's taking off the weight of the, um, of the joints. That I can understand by knees and hips, but fingers? What, 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 I mean, there is no real body weight on the fingers. Why, why should that be? No, it's, it's overall, it's holistically. Okay. It, it, it's not specific to specific body part. It's your, if you look at your... <laughs> your skeleton, so to speak. It's the whole body's pressure on the skeleton. And with me, for example, it was, it manifested in my hands. But um, a lot of people really get arthritis. It's all over the body. It's not just in the hands. I was just lucky. But I have made a conscious decision at the time. I'm not going to inherit this from my mom. I'm stopping it in my bloodline. So I never had pain, although my fingers were swollen. Then I learned from that book what to do that I can reduce the swelling, especially if I've been writing a lot or typing a lot. But again, it, it's the whole body weight on the body on the whole body system. It's not just pertaining to a specific area. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, as we are talking about losing weight, uh, are you familiar with uh, blood type diets where they say that the blood type zero shouldn't uh, eat carbohydrates or only very little, while the blood type A is perfect for, for vegetarian uh, food and things like that? No, you don't. I, I, find I know, it I know about that, Heidi. I know about that, but I'm, I'm completely, if I have to eat like my blood type, I, can't, I've, I won't be eating like I'm eating today. And I've been eating this way for more than 30 years. So my blood type said I should eat meat, and I've been a vegetarian for more than 32 years. So, and I'm completely healthy. We go and test all my kids, it's all perfect. So it, it's I've still, again, it's one of those things like Beatrice said, it's not one shoe fits everybody. Exactly, and that's one of the many ways trying to figure out what, what it is, what increases. I heard also that there are certain bacteria in the intestine, which are yours, which um, are in favor of uh, gaining weight, you know, when you have uh, too many or this certain type and so on. So there seems to be a lot still to understand what, how digestion works <laughs> and how the metabolism is working. So, mm -hmm. In the meantime, uh, the intermittent uh, fasting, I tried to do that at least 14, 15 hours not to eat anything. And so I can avoid that I have to forbid myself. You shouldn't eat this. Mm. <laughs> Monia, what do you think? You keep nodding and <laughs> I, I see the wheels turning. Uh... It's just the same because I keep telling myself, do you want to eat that now or do you want to be a little, little less of your pounds on the, on the, on the scales next time? And then I just leave it. I'm a blood type zero 
and I've had so heard so many different things, what I should and what I shouldn't, so I really don't know. And I love carbohydrates, that's my problem. Yeah. But living in Vienna, that's karma. It is very interesting to me how also where you live, I don't know, or what you grow up with. I, I'm curious about that, like what your body's used to, what you grow up with, you know, and one diet in one region is totally fine for everybody in that region. And some, if somebody comes from the outside and tries to adopt it, you know, it might have very weird effects on their body. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just thought it was very interesting when I, like, I never drink coffee at night. It's just not a thing I do because I can't sleep and it really affects me. But when I was traveling in Austria, everybody has coffee after dinner. It's just part of, you know, or not, no, but not, I mean, not everybody, but it's, but it's having coffee in the afternoon or after dinner happens a lot. It doesn't happen here that way. Mm -hmm. And I participated and was totally fine while I was there. So I don't know. So that's also interesting, the psychology, mm. you know, and I don't usually eat as much meat and cheese and bread and, you know, but, but I was eating so much of that while I was traveling. Um, I eat very differently in different places and yeah. And that has different effects on me, which is interesting. Well, I still remember when living in the States, I usually had the salad. I left out the main course and then I had the dessert. And I was very slim. And coming back to Austria, uh, I adopted eating the main course as well. And that's, yeah, <laughs> it shows right away. But it's, uh, I guess it's the kind of what we call in German Frustessen. So, the pandemic frustration eating. Uh, and this is what I'm trying to stop now, even though the pandemic is over and we are probably going to have to wear the masks again in public places. Uh, or Right now we only have to wear them in uh, transport and in uh, pharmacies or at the doctors, I believe. And they, uh, I'm now, and they just waited until the election is got. We had an election last Sunday. And after that, so it's very much a political issue as well. And that's really frustrating. But my husband and I, we are wearing the masks because at, now it's the flu season. So why? I don't want the flu either. So <laughs> yeah. And we are about the only people in our family who haven't had the virus yet. And yeah, we're just cautious. But of course, as I said, we have reduced and if I'm 20 years younger, I want to go out and I want to go to concerts and I want to be with my friends. And yeah, that's the way it is. So every age group probably also has their own. And I know, uh, I know of a very old woman who just add one egg a day or in the evening, and that's all she needed. She didn't need any, anything uh, and some milk, I guess. But uh, yeah, so it's, it depends very much on the individual. That's really. And uh, whenever there comes up a new diet, I don't do it. It's just well, but the intermittent fasting <clears throat> sounds feasible. And probably I do it without noticing, yeah. Well, your mother lost so much, so many pounds. I was amazed and now, uh, yeah, sore, a sore topic for her probably. Heidi, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to bring some joke in. I, I wanted to say, let's continue our spiritual development and then we can, can live with only air and sun and we don't need to eat. <laughs> so the, the problem to choose what to eat. But there are many people who believe that, that you only need the air and sunshine and, and love, of course, and then you can thrive. But uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, the, and the problem of our time now is that the media, it's like a snowball system. They just 
hype it and people pick it up. Otherwise, they would have never cared about something. I'm getting rather sleepy right now. <laughs> oh, are we going? Uh, it's, over only, there? it's only seven o'clock. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I won't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee tonight either. Um, but you know that it's dark, getting dark now. And so the, intuitively, the body says, oh, it's time yeah. to sleep. Uh, <laughs> Is it in South Africa the same thing? No, it's uh, it's getting dark about this hour. It's already pitch black dark. Oh, it's already yeah. Yeah, but because we're supposed to be still in spring, although we have summer weather, um, but it <laughs> it's it's already it's already at half past six. It's already mm. dark. Oh. Oh. But you know what? The, I you said something earlier. I just want to quickly say this that. I found fascinating. I when I wake up, I see the sun come up. So I'm very used to at this at the level that the sun comes up, as well as the color. And in the last month, it's incredible. The sun is red in the morning when it when it, when it rises. Before it was like orangey, you know, a more orangey color, more, a lot more gentler. It's literally red. It's frightening. Because when it comes up on the horizon, so that's why obviously why we also have um, heat waves most probably. But you can see even the level that it usually would come up in September, of an October, September here, but with us, it's at a very different angle. So there are cosmologically something happening too as well that impacts our weather, besides us humans, you know, stuffing up our own planet. But it's but it's red, red it's 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 rather frightening to watch it. And then slowly, within half an hour of rising, the color becomes less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I've never seen it before like that. And I've been here now almost, almost two years since the pandemic. I have heard that there are a lot of uh, sun eruptions uh, going mm -hmm. on at the moment, yeah. high intensity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe so you see that there. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice it yet. We have all the sky always. Uh, like a, a, a mist on the sky, so that you hardly ever see the sun mm -hmm. anymore clearly. So I have my ideas about that, and I'm quite angry, but that doesn't help. <laughs> so, yeah, let's go. But Monia, you must think in two weeks, then it's only six o'clock now, so you go to bed at 6.30. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, I won't go to bed, but I'm just, maybe I just dance around or do move around, not that bad, but move around a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, at the end of October, we will have one hour, less, so it won't be as dark. Exactly. And we are, it's dark at 4.30, something like that. I hate this. I, I would love to be uh, like, you know, a little bit like in the Ecuador, where the same night and day, uh, I like, I would love that. But we have this, what we have. If we were where we are, I wish you a good day and a good evening. And we see you again in two weeks. Heidi, when, um, since I'm not going to be here for the next two times, when the time changes, I guess it's fall back, the hour is going to fall back. Do we still meet at your 6 p.m. time? That's not going to change. I will, I will think about it. I just uh, stopped the recording. Okay.